Heart Doctor. Ah, my baby. My baby John Pertwee from 1970 hmm. to 1974. You know, I've definitely talked about the Pertwee era before, but so far, I don't think I've actually dedicated a video primarily to something of his like I have with the other classic Doctors. Well, it's about time to change that. And what better way is there than with a Bad Apples instalment? <laughs> Certain writers just embody different periods, and when it comes to the early 70s, I can't think of a writer more quintessentially third Doctor than Malcolm Hulk. Of course, Malcolm Hulk was already involved with the show long before the Third Doctor era, submitting ideas to the production office as early as 1964. He finally got his foot in the door during the Second Doctor era when he co-wrote his first serial with David Ellis in 1967, resulting in an eerie body snatchers outing set at Gatwick Airport called The Faceless Ones, which remained relatively uncelebrated in itself for the longest time due to its subsequent patchy archival status, something the 2020 animation has thankfully somewhat rectified. Anyway, Hulk was also a good friend of fellow prolific Doctor Who writer Terence Dix, and the two of them collaborated on the grand 1969 finale to the Second Doctor era, The War Games, a sprawling, intense, conspiratorial ten-part epic, which not only redefined the lead character's backstory and the show's overall premise scarily well, but also sent them both both into a new, seemingly counterintuitive creative direction of being limited to Earth for the foreseeable future, but in a way that was completely narratively justified. It's impossible to overstate what a triumph The War Games is. With John Pertwee's third Doctor making his debut in the show's seventh season, Malcolm Hulk very quickly became a cornerstone of this era's narrative and political approach. Hulk is celebrated for bringing a more nuanced view of morality to the table when structuring his serials, viewing conflicts more as shades of grey instead of black and white, and tending to subvert typical hero-villain dynamics, as well as being unafraid to delve into wider systemic issues and corruption. Now obviously, he's far from the only Classic Who writer to have covered this ground, but he seems to have developed a reputation of being among the most blatant of his contemporaries, and I suppose I can see why since these do have a strong consistent focus in all of his scripts. The War Games aside, arguably his most significant contribution is the 1970 serial Doctor Who and the Silurians, a complex moral dilemma where a race of prehistoric historic lizard men who once ruled the Earth, awaken from millennia of subterranean hibernation to discover that humans have risen to become the dominant life form in their absence. The serial thoughtfully explores concepts like rightful land ownership and the fear of the other, and from both points of view of the humans and the Silurians. And as a narrative, it turned out so nice that Hulk did it twice. The second occurrence, the iconic fan favourite 1972 serial The Seed, Devils, turned the slumbering lizards aquatic and threw in the master to further complicate the interspecies conflict for his own gain. Oh yes, Hulk was very interested in exploring racial tensions and how deliberate acts of subterfuge by malicious outside forces who benefit from the conflict can exacerbate the hostilities and strain diplomatic relations to the point where irrationality overpowers reason and cooperation, as also showcased in Frontier in Space. A stellar political space thriller that sometimes gets unfairly painted as nothing more than Prison Cell Simulator 1973. Also, there's the master again, hi Bestie Boo. And on top of that, Hulk also penned the environmentalism-themed Invasion of the Dinosaurs in 1974, and joined Terence Dix in finalising David Whittaker's last serial for the show in the form of 1970's The Ambassadors of Death. Imagine having the three best ever Doctor Who writers all working on the same story. 
Well, and Trevor Ray. Hi, dude. Both of these tales are pretty subversive, taking the premises of prehistoric chaos in modern-day London, and the apparent kidnapping of Mars probe astronauts respectively, and flipping them on their heads with the revelation that the real villains behind both narratives are actually corrupt humans. Delusional, high-ranking political and military officials who, in other contexts, we'd likely put our trust in to protect us from such crises. Hulk was very interested in deconstructing these facets of our political landscape, and using sci-fi to question the authorities that govern our lives, and it's safe to say that the Pertwee era wouldn't be the same without his influence. Hell, even the Faceless Ones ends with diplomacy. So much for all invaders getting nuked in the Troughton era. But yeah, most people sing Hulk's praises, especially when it comes to the war games and his Silurians and Sea Devils scripts. But you know how this goes by now. There is one other entry of his that people seem less enamoured by. The fourth serial of the show's eighth season and the fifth of Hulk's output, Colony in Space occupies an interesting position in the context of the Third Doctor's run, as it is the first off-world adventure to grace this heavily Earthbound era. Sort of. Inferno ventured to a parallel world, and Ambassadors of Death and Claws of Axos sent the Doctor into space, but this is the first clear-cut example where the narrative is distinctly set on another planet that the Doctor gets to by TARDIS, and with no unit in sight. So if, for whatever reason, you're finding yourself fatigued by the idea of yet another Earthbound six-parter filled with bristling authoritarian standoffs with heartless corporations, and countless military shootouts breaking the peaceful sophistication of the English countryside, well firstly, what's wrong with you, get some taste, but secondly, this excursion should provide some relief from that and liven things up a bit, right? Well, maybe in theory, but in practice, apparently not. Because Colony in Space has consistently ended up as one of the lowest rated Pertwee serials. Ugh, what happened there? Did Hulk miss the mark? Let's find out. To start off with, let's explore that off-Earth aspect. So after an unbroken string of eight consecutive Earthbound serials where the Doctor worked shoulder to shoulder with the fine chaps of Unit, the powers that be decided it was time the Third Doctor finally got his first proper dosage of that whole travelling through time and space malarkey. But how could they go about doing that with the Doctor firmly exiled to Earth by the Time Lords? It hadn't even been two whole seasons since that state status quo shift was implemented. It'd be anticlimactic to completely throw it out now just for a change of scenery. Well, the narrative justification they came up with was that the Time Lords temporarily loosen their stranglehold on the Doctor's freedom, and send him to a specific location for a mission of universal importance, allowing the show its first excursion to an alien planet in a couple of years, while still assuring that the Doctor's movements are still technically limited. Limited. Pretty ingenious, and also a fascinating step in the relationship between the Doctor and the Time Lords. They persecuted him for breaking their laws of non-interference, even after admitting that he made some good points in his defence, and now here they are, underhandedly using the Doctor as a pawn to enact their own meddling. Love that. I think it's also a smart move for the Master's involvement to be the catalyst here. Nothing would convince the Time Lords to do this more successfully than one of their own going rogue, and as Terror of the Auton shows, he was clearly already on their radar as a pretty sus individual that they were keeping tabs on. Alarm bells do be ringing now that he's eyeing up the Doomsday Weapon. This is all great from the Doctor and Joe's angle too, by the way. The Doctor, of course, finally getting his first tantalising taste of the freedom that he's been hungry for, and Joe experiencing the double whammy shock of entering the TARDIS for the first time and suddenly taking her first ever trip to an alien planet with no warning, and their reactions to these circumstances are delicious. Before I was stranded on Earth, I spent all my time exploring new worlds and seeking the wonders of the universe. But you don't know what's out there! Then let's find out! It's gorgeous characterization, and this is something that Hulk never fails at for the record, so all good so far. So the TARDIS lands, and the Doctor and Joe step out onto a quarry. Ah. 
Okay, so this is quite an interesting point of note, because across the research I've done, looking into the reasons why this story tends to be lower rung among Malcolm Hulk's work and John Pertwee serials in general, a common target of dissatisfaction that I've seen is the way that this story looks. And uh, yeah, I'll concede that it's not the prettiest outing even by Classic Who standards, with large segments being set on location in this very drab and lifeless gravel pit, and the rest of it in sets which are largely lacking in colour or really anything of visual interest. It probably doesn't help that this is another case of what I'll dub New Earth Syndrome. You know, the furthest we've travelled from Earth in a long time and it's to a place that looks as if it could basically just be Earth again. It's hard to conflate this point with the wider discussion of Hulk's work, because surely Hulk isn't really responsible for aspects of production like this. But then again, the desolate aesthetic is is also very much rooted in the actual text of the narrative, and does actually inform part of the conflict concerning the colony. So, at the same time, it also kind of is relevant here? Maybe if we actually get to the colony, we can figure out where we stand on this topic. Well, in no time, the Doctor and Joe end up being escorted to this aforementioned colony, and it's here where Hulk begins to flex his socio-political fingers. He paints a very bleak picture of a desperate and haggard group of people. Having come here with the hope of starting a fresh new world after having fled the increasing industrialization, pollution, and overcrowding of Earth. And yet, after a year on this planet, their crops still aren't growing, their food supplies are running Low, and they're barely scraping by with what little resources they have left. But they're still clinging to the hope that a solution will be found, and are still fiercely protective of their claim to this land, because, as much of a dire struggle their situation may be, it's still the only place they call home, and it's still arguably better than where they came from. That is horribly depressing. I love it. So yeah, to close the discussion of the way this serial looks, maybe you could make a case for better production values or more distinctive direction, but otherwise I disagree with the notion that the drab aesthetic is a point against it. Hell, if anything I think it helps to enhance Hulk's statement. An empty, muddy, lifeless quarry where crops struggle to grow is still preferable to the hellscape that Earth has become. Jesus Christ. That sharp comment tree aside, I think the individual characters of this colony are decent enough and pretty sympathetic, though admittedly they're not Hulk's best by any stretch. The leader, Robert Ash, and his daughter Mary serve as the face of this community, frustrated but making do with what little they've got, while David Winton is more confrontational, championing the idea of moving the colony to a more suitable world, that is, before he is forced to change sides by the arrival of the miners. Oh boy, this is where things get spicy. The colonists thought they were safe from human industrialization. Oh, bless them. See, as I said earlier, one of Hulk's biggest thematic fascinations was systemic corruption, and exploring the insidious, flat-out morally reprehensible lengths that corporations or institutions will go to for achieving their goals. Interplanetary Mining Corp, or IMC, turn up, claiming that they have been assigned the mineral rights to this world, and are determined to plunder these resources by any means necessary, for the benefit of their wallet- <coughs> oh sorry, I mean sustaining the suffocating status quo back on Earth. However, the colony's presence is an inconvenience that stands in their way, and so IMC employ multiple slimy and criminal tactics to undermine the colonial claim to the planet. Oh yes, like Hulk's own Doctor Who and the Silurians, this is a tale of rightful land ownership, only this time the conflict is viewed through the lens of cold corporate malfeasance and greed. Naturally, IMC have their facade of formalities, turning up on the colonists' doorstep and denying any foreknowledge of their presence as if this were all an honest misunderstanding, but of course still sending for an adjudicator to legally enforce their own claim and boot the colonists out of their home. But then of course they have their underhanded activities, like staging attacks on colonists with the intent of scaring them off-world by framing the planet's native life forms 
problems. Adding to the fear-mongering with the employment of a plant claiming to be from another colony besieged by these same natives. And of course, even escalating to taking hostages and strapping them to a bomb to ensure the silence of any witnesses or anyone who puts two and two together. See, it's all got to appear above board when the adjudicator turns up. Very slimy and very compelling. In charge of IMC's operations is Captain Dent, who, my god, he's Hulk's depiction of capitalism condensed into a person. Soulless, ruthlessly opportunistic, and scarily creative with the scenarios he conceives of to get himself and his company off the hook for their misdeeds. Having the Doctor murdered? Back on Earth, tens of thousands of people die every day. Traffic accidents, suicides, pollution, no, epidemics. Thing, you know Incarcerating Joe and chaining her to a bomb. She was caught attempting to rob this spaceship. You've got no right to hold her without- ...with interplanetary law, she's committed a capital offence. Sending the colonists to certain death in a dangerously unsafe rocket. We offered to check their ship to make sure it was safe. They refused our help. It's all in my report. And it's not even like he's bloodthirsty about it necessarily. He does it purely to ensure the success of their mission, and ergo, monetary gain. The colonist's homelessness or even death is all just collateral damage to him, irrelevant in the face of profit, and that just makes him all the more effective and chilling. The only thing about Dent that I find strange is that after his despicable worldview crescendos with arguably his most brutally callous moment, he completely vanishes from the story. The conflict gets resolved, the colonists fake their deaths and manage to turn the tables on IMC and send them packing. But Dent specifically? We never see again. Was this an intentional decision? Is this meant to be commentary on how the most powerful men never receive consequences for their actions? I mean, maybe if we'd seen him escape in some manner, but that's not the case. He's just gone and no one comments on it. Not that I need to see his comeuppance, but still, it's a strange choice. Aside from that curious detail, I think all of this is great stuff. You've got the makings of a certified hood classic here, but I know what you're thinking. Wait, earlier, didn't you mention the planet's native life forms? Where do they fit into all this? And come to think of it, didn't you also mention sending for an adjudicator to legally enforce their own claim? What happened with that? And hey, hold up, what about the Master's involvement? Is he in this? And hey, what did you mean when you said alarm bells do be ringing now that he's eyeing up the Doomsday Weapon? That sounds big. Apocalyptic even. So where does that fit into the plot? Well, strap in. So about halfway through the serial, IMC send for an adjudicator to legally rule that they own the planet and have every right to evict the colonists. The adjudicator is, you guessed it, our beardy boy in disguise. Beginning Hulk's interesting recurring trend of the master corrupting the legal system, something he'd revisit with the Sea Devils and Frontier in Space. Now, the master does not give a damn about this land dispute. Of course he doesn't. Hijacking this conflict is just a means to an end. And that end is to find an ancient city belonging to the native life. Oh yeah, there was already a civilization on this planet long before the colonists turned up. They're fairly chill with sharing the planet, but they do get a bit tetchy with anyone going near their city. And when the master locates it and ventures to its heart with the doctor in episode 6, we find out why. The master is after the doom Day weapon, an incredibly destructive device built by this civilization, with the potential to instantly obliterate stars and essentially achieve total dominion over the universe. You can see why it piqued the interest of the guy who literally calls himself the Master, and he hopes it will enthrall the Doctor too. After all, think of all the good he could achieve by sharing in that absolute power, you know, ignoring the fact that the society who built this weapon devolved severely as a result of merely creating the thing, symbolising how absolute power corrupts, just think of how such a device could be an incredibly powerful asset in one's fight against injustice and oppression. All the wars he could stop, all the suffering he could put an end to, but the Doctor adamantly refuses. Of course he does. He recognises that it doesn't matter how noble your intentions are with totalitarian rule, because that kind of power is evil in itself. This 
is awesome. It's a pivotal moment in the Doctor and Master relationship, and might just be the perfect showcase for their interpersonal conflict and ideological differences. It's top tier character drama. The point is that one must rule or serve, that's a basic law of life. I want to see the universe, not rule it. But there is a tiny, teensy wincy little problem with this aspect of the plot. What does any of this have to do with the colonists' dispute with the miners? Yeah, remember that's what the bulk of this serial was about? How does this doomsday weapon stuff fit into that? Okay, granted, there are a few connecting threads. The reason why the planetary environment is so unforgiving in the first place is because of the pollutant nature of the doomsday weapon. And after its destruction, everything is apparently all hunky-dory and the colonists can grow their crops again. And as mentioned earlier, the natives are fairly chill with the colonists. Sometimes they even help each other out. Out, I ship this one and his technician bestie. Hell, at one point they half rescue, half kidnap Joe from IMC captivity and take her to their city, establishing its existence earlier on so that there is some form of setup for this part of the narrative. But when it comes to the core conflicts of these two plot points, the colony's bitter land dispute against IMC's capitalist goals, and the master's hunger for total universal domination, there is no direct correlation. Thematically, you could argue that they both showcase how greed can be morally corrupting, but they have very little direct relevance to each other. This isn't to say everything in a story needs to intersect, but in this case it's just bizarre that the idea of the Master potentially holding the universe at gunpoint to assume total control over it, literally the reason why the Time Lord sent the Doctor to this world in the first place, is presented as a tenuously connected side story to the main narrative about some farmers holding their own against a mining company. Some people say that this story's fatal flaw is shoehorning the master in where he doesn't belong, but I think that's an oversimplification. It's not a case of the master simply not belonging in this narrative. It's a case of the master's motivations and the land ownership conflict not being woven together as well as they could have been. I don't think the serial even once pauses to consider Consider the ramifications of what would happen if IMC find the Doomsday Weapon. Seriously. It's all profound to ponder an egomaniac like the Master getting his hands on something that powerful, but what about the insidious money-hungry mining corporation who are literally poised to plunder this planet for resources? The Doctor doesn't seem concerned about that possibility. The Master doesn't use their equipment or expertise to find it. The Doomsday Weapon might as well be on a completely separate world world. It's such a strange oversight. Maybe this is part of what throws people off. You get five episodes of a bitter land ownership dispute, and then right towards the end they drop a seemingly unconnected super weapon on you, and you're like, wait, so you literally had universally higher stakes just a stone's throw away all this time? Yeah, if I were tidying this up a little, I'd have it so the Master is actually super invested in IMC's claim to the planet due to their mining equipment. Because then, by helping them win this legal battle, he could use them as pawns to locate and excavate the Doomsday Weapon. That way, the Miner's victory can be directly and cohesively tied into the Master's apocalyptic goals, and that would alleviate this disconnect. Perhaps this could open another layer of conflict on the Master's side of things having to keep Dent and IMC in the dark about this technology they're digging up so they don't get ideas above their station. I'm salivating just thinking about this, man. But alas, that's not the world we live in, and honestly that's a shame because aside from, well, that disconnect, I think this story slaps. I don't know, maybe I'm just a classic who elitist, but I dig the pacing. I dig the pessimistic tone complemented by grungy visuals. I dig where it sits in the timelines and relationships between the Doctor and Joe, the Master, and the Time Lords respectively. And I dig its exploration of capitalist greed, land ownership, and the corruption of absolute power. Hulk didn't slouch when it came to any of that, but I think the overall premise just needed a bit more cohesion. Because, as is, the inclusion 
conclusion of the Master's quest to find a super weapon ends up feeling like the serial going off on a tangent rather than being a seamless complement to the main colonial premise, and that can feel distracting. With that said, I get why some people might consider this to be the weakest Malcolm Hulk story, though I'm not entirely sure whether I actually agree there. Either way, it certainly ain't War Games caliber, and I'd easily take Frontier in Space, The Ambassadors of Death, and Doctor Who and the Silurians over it, so I probably do agree that it's locked into his lower tier of work, but like, whether or not this really is the worst he gets, I'm still pretty keen on it regardless, so that ain't saying much. So all in all, um, yeah, reverse the skibbity, or whatever it is the third doctor says. <laughs> Thank you.